All right, Willow Creek, how we doing? It's great to, great to have you here. I want to welcome those of you joining us in your living room, on your treadmill. Uh, no matter what Willow campus you represent, we're so excited to have you. So those who are joining us from Willow, South Lake, North Shore, Crystal Lake, Huntley, Wheaton, Chicago, South Barrington, it is a pleasure to have you with us this weekend. Uh, as mentioned, we are wrapping up our journey through Daniel. Have you enjoyed the journey through Daniel? Uh, it's been a great, great experience. Uh, it's my first journey series as a part of Willow Creek. It's been a really meaningful series for me. And really getting to dive into Daniel has been a really enriching experience for me personally. Now, on the weekend, we've had the opportunity to listen to our senior pastor, Dave Dumman, as well as Albert Tate, Megan Marshman, help us really unpack the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. And what we discovered is Daniel was this uh, Hebrew young man, and he lived in Israel when it was conquered by the nation of Babylon. And he was one of those that was seen as intellectual capital. And so he was taken out of Israel. He was carted off to Babylon as an exile. And so Daniel, along with his three friends that became known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they lived as exiles in this foreign land. And they had to wrestle with this question, how do we stand up for a God in a world that doesn't? How, how do we live for a God in a culture that does it. And I think that the question that Daniel was wrestling with is a question that we too have to wrestle with. That how do we be people who stand for God in a culture that doesn't? And so again, over the weekends, we've been really unpacking the faithfulness of Daniel all along the way and how he sought out God. And, and it was in his faithfulness that God also proved himself faithful. And God shows up in a fiery furnace and God shows up in a lion's den. And there's some amazing, remarkable stories that really highlight Daniel's faithfulness, but also the faithfulness of our great God. Now, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel, they're the, they're the fun part of the book of Daniel. Uh, it's narrative, it's story. We get to really lean into uh, all the different things we've already talked about. The back half of the book of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, it's a little bit more difficult uh, uh, ground to cover. Uh, the, the back half of the book of Daniel is more prophetic literature. It's full of images, symbols. Some would even describe the genre of the back half of Daniel as apocalyptic literature. It's the same type of genre as the book of Revelation. And so it's full of all these symbols, all these images. And sometimes there's just a wide variety of interpretive methodology trying to figure out what in the world does this stuff mean? And so as we tackle really the back half of the book of Daniel today, here's the approach that I would like to take. With all the images, all the symbols, all the different types of interpretive methodology, we could really get caught up in the details and lose sight of the bigger picture. But I don't want to do that. Instead, I would love to take a step back. And I would love to really take a look at the big picture and see what is the message that God is trying to communicate to us through this very uh, uh, fascinating piece of literature, the, the message that God wants to communicate to us through Daniel. Here's how I think about this. Uh, how many of you have ever been to the Chicago Art Institute? Right? Many of you home, you, you've been a part of, uh, you've been to the Chicago Art Institute. I love the, the museums downtown. Uh, love the, the Field Museum. My favorite is the Museum of Science and Industry. We've also been to the Shedd Aquarium. I love all the different museums downtown. But I remember the very first time I went to the Art Institute, I felt a little bit out of place. I mean, it's a really enjoyable experience. I loved it. But I, I found out that I'm not as cultured of a person as some people are. Because I was just people watching at the Art Institute, and it felt like there were two groups of people. There were the people like me who were just kind of there to enjoy the experience, and then there were people who really knew art, right? And really knew really what they were looking at. They could really experience the richness of it in a way that I probably couldn't. And you could pick these people out because they were the ones that would walk up to a piece of art. They'd take off their glasses. They'd really stare intently into a piece of art. It was almost like they were looking at every little brushstroke and every little brushstroke had a little sense of meaning in of itself. Now, I'm not that smart. And so I wasn't able to look at every little brushstroke, but what I was able to do is to take a step back and look at the entire picture and draw incredible appreciation for the entire piece of art. And I'd like to take that approach as we look at the back half of the book of Daniel today. Again, we could look at the details, but I don't want us to get lost in the brushstrokes. There's value in it. There, there's, there's reason to dive in, to learn more, to be challenged. It's good to talk about these, discuss these things, uh, even debate about these things. But sometimes when we really look into the brushstrokes intently, we lose sight of the bigger message. And so today we're going to take a step back. And we're looking at the message that God is wanting to see through this series of visions that he gives Daniel at the back half of the book. And so if you look at Daniel chapter 7 through 12, you'll actually find three visions. 
There's one in chapter 7, there's another in chapter 8, there's another one in chapters 10 through 12. They're very different in a lot of ways, but I think at the heart of it, they're all trying to communicate the same message. And so for the sake of our conversation today, I'm going to anchor us in Daniel 7, which is the first vision. And what I want to do is I want to share, here's what the vision was. Here's how we understand the vision, and then I want to talk about a couple of really important takeaways for us as we apply this vision into our journey. We ready to dive in? All right, here you go. Daniel chapter 7. It's a strange vision. Now, again, Daniel was the one that was doing the interpretations of all the dreams. Now he's having his own dream. And even by his own admission, he's having a hard time interpreting his own dream. But here's his dream. Here's what he sees. He sees these four beasts that come out of the sea. Here's how he describes those beasts. The first one, verse 4, says this. The first was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. Second is in verse 5. It says, and there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. Verse 6 says, and after that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like like those of a bird. And here we get to 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 the climactic moment. Uh, Verse 7, it says, And after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was the fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims. It trampled underfoot whatever was left. Uh, Daniel admits a little bit later that this this dream kind of freaked him out a little bit. I mean, he didn't know what to do with it. It, 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 He felt like he kind of messed with him a little bit. These, These four creatures, and the fourth one looked ferocious. It looked like the fourth one was just devouring and destroying everything. But the vision almost stops and then immediately there's this beautiful picture of the ancient of days. It's a description of God. It's that God in all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his might. It's just a picture of our great God. And so all the the beasts and all their destruction is set in juxtaposition of our great God. And then a new person is introduced to the vision. Verse 13, we read this. It says, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations of people of every language worship him. Now let's stop there for a moment. Notice what he says. It was a son of man that came, which in the ancient Hebrew text, son of man was just like, he was just a dude. I mean, he's just kind of a, a human human. But he wasn't just any human, Right? Because look at the characteristics that Daniel's describing are happening to this human human. He was one who was given glory, sovereign power, all nations of people of every language. What do they do? They worshiped him. You don't just worship any old dude. You don't just worship a a human person. This was a human person that somehow had taken on divinity. And then here's what it says. Don't miss this last statement. It says, his dominion is is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Uh, Let's just anchor ourselves in that statement. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And if we take that statement, we put that in our back pocket, that is going to be the key anchor statement that unlocks this vision that God gives to us through Daniel. Now, Daniel has this dream. He has this vision. At the end of it, he's like, I don't know what to do with this. Again, it kind of messes with me. It kind of freaks me out in some ways, but I don't, I don't fully know what to do with it. But thankfully, God provides some instruction on how to make some sense of it, how to interpret it. And so a little bit later in chapter 7, we're given the meaning of this crazy vision. And so Daniel is told these four beasts, what they refer to is four different earthly kingdoms. Now, some people try to actually define which kingdom it was. And some people suggest the first beast was the kingdom of Babylon, then the kingdom of Persia, then the kingdom of Greece, and ultimately the last one points to Rome. Some would suggest it points to something beyond Rome. But no matter what we interpret the detail, what we recognize is these are four earthly kingdoms that are attempting to thwart the things of God. They're attempting to crush the things of God and even the people of God. But here's the good news, my friends. Our God is a God who will not be thwarted. Our God is a God who is in no way, in no way threatened by the kingdoms of this world. No matter what happens with the kingdoms of this world, our God stands apart from that. He will not be defeated. He will not be conquered. He will not be thwarted. Our God is a glorious, majestic, authoritative, supreme God. That's who God is. And so you have the pictures of these kingdoms of this world 
and a God who is truly reigning supreme. And then in comes this character, this, this son of man. Now you and I know now that son of man was a term that Jesus applied for himself. But when, when Daniel was writing this book, Jesus was still hundreds of years ahead. And so it must have been a really peculiar thing that God would raise up somebody that was human, but he would also have divine characteristics that those who attempted to defeat and destroy the things of God, even defeat, destroy God's people. There would be a one among God's people, the son of man, that though seemingly looked defeated, would be raised up, seated at the right hand of God, given all authority, power, and glory to reign over the very nations that tried to destroy him. What a beautiful picture in Jesus. And notice what it says. It says his dominion will never pass. Like his kingdom will last forever. So what's the overarching message that God has given us through this vision that God gave to Daniel? Here it is. My friends, in this world, there will be kingdoms that rise and fall. In this world, there will be kingdoms that come and go. That has been true of every generation, of every century, of every millennia. It was true of the Persians, of the Greeks, of the Romans. It has been true all throughout human history. There are kingdoms that will rise and fall. There are kingdoms that will come and go. There is only one kingdom that stands forever, and that is the kingdom of our great God. And so what Daniel is is reminding us of is that you are members, not just of earthly kingdoms, your citizenship, your membership, your ultimate connection is to God's kingdom. And so if if we recognize that, we don't lose hope. That when our world looks really dark, we we recognize our citizenship is a part of heavenly kingdom. When it looks like all hope is lost, hope is not lost because our citizenship is connected to an everlasting kingdom. And if that's the message that God has wanted to give us, I want to give us two really powerful takeaways of what this means for us. Here's the first takeaway for us. We have to be people who recognize our true citizenship. We gotta be people who, who recognize our, our, our true citizenship. Again, you not only find this theme in the book of Daniel, you find it elsewhere in scripture. Paul even writes to it in the book of Philippians. Here's what Paul says about it. He says, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul reminds us, hey, you gotta remember, no matter what happens in this world, your citizenship is not just connected here, your citizenship is connected up there. Now, I'm somebody who was born in the United States. I've only lived in this country. It's the only country I've ever been able to call home. But there are lots and lots of people who are part of the Willow family that have a different story. Uh, That their country of origin is from another place, that they were born in Honduras or or Mexico. Maybe they were born somewhere in Africa or Australia. Uh, Maybe they come from Korea or China or, or, or Spain or Portugal, right? That there are people who are part of the Willow family, that part of their story is, I was born in one place, I now live in another. And there's something about those who carry that story that when it comes to this principle, we have a lot to learn from our family members who have a story of immigration. Because they understand this particular principle spiritually, possibly better than those of us who don't have the same experience. And so I think it's wise for us to lean into that experience, to learn a little bit more from it. I want to introduce you to a, to a, a person who attends Willow. His name's William. And as he shares his story about what home looks like, there's so much that we can see in our own story. Here's William's story. The following video contains scenes of war. Viewer discretion is advised. Every time that uh, we're getting together as a family, we cook the, the, the recipes from home. I think we have brought a little bit of our country here. You know, we were taken out of the country, but the country hasn't been taken away from us. I grew up in El Salvador. At the age of two years old, my mother decided to leave the country and migrate to the U.S. My mom left us with our grandparents. Growing up, it was great. Uh, Beautiful farming life. My grandmother, she was a very loving lady. And her cooking was the best. (laughs) When I think about the farm, I picture my grandfather. He would tell me, you know, look at how beautiful that that field looks. You know, look at how beautiful the corn is coming up.
that last day, we were coming back from from the farm, and you know, we would see somebody dead on the side of the uh, the road. It was people that we knew uh, that were killed. My my grandmother, my grandfather, they had to make a, a decision and and just take us to the village. It was the toughest thing to do. We're leaving everything behind. Laying in bed. And then you start hearing gunshots. And then you hear the uh, the bullets hit the wall. The kids, they were screaming and crying. Mom saying, be quiet, you know, quiet. You don't want to be heard. couldn't go to school because they used to go to the schools and grab the kids and just take them. About 13 years old, I was recruited. I was part of a ward now. The first night that I, you know, got that rifle placed on my hands was the longest night of my life. Of all the kids that I used to play with, um, only a couple of them survived. When I came to the U.S., it was hard not knowing the language and not having too many people to talk to. A lot of times I thought, you know, I don't belong here in this country. You know, why didn't I stay back there? I felt like I was out of place. I didn't belong here, and I couldn't go back there. I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. God's grace has been really good to me. In this country, I've been able to do a lot of things. I've made the, the U.S. my home for the last 38 years. But I tell my wife that the first thing I'm doing when I uh, retire is going back home. I, I can't wait for that day to say, you know what? I'm going back home. Not saying that this is not home. Right now, this is home. But when I go back, it's going to be my real home. I mean, I love William's story. Just as he says, like, this is my home but my heart's still with my real home. There, there's something about those who are part of the Willow family that have a story of immigration. They understand this principle of citizenship possibly better than, than anybody else. And it kind of causes me to return back to the book of Philippians to remi- be mindful of what Paul was talking about here, where he says our, our citizenship is in heaven. So we, we might live here, but our heart is a part of a home somewhere else. It says we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's fascinating about Paul's words in this particular text is in the city of Philippi, it was actually considered uh, a a province uh, or uh, it was a province of the the, the empire of Rome. And so what it meant by that is though Philippi was a Greek city, uh, Rome was trying to establish Roman culture in that city. And so they would build Roman roads, they would bring in Roman statues, they would try to bring Roman culture in. You've heard the phrase home away from home, Philippi was Rome away from Rome right? Uh, That was kind of the perspective. And so if you lived in Philippi, you had a couple of options. You could try to hold on to Greek culture or you could embrace what was new and you could bring Roman culture into this new expression. And so I I sense that Paul's alluding to that when he talks about our citizenship isn't heavy. 
He basically is reminding us that though we might live in some sort of kingdom on this earth, our ultimate home is in heaven. And if we're, if we're able to, if we're willing to, what we do is we actually take things from the heavenly kingdom and we bring them into our current reality. The truth is, the call in our lives is we need to be people who live a life down here that will matter up there. We got to be people who live a life down here that will matter up here. So here's what that means. In a world of hypocrisy, citizens of heaven, we bring integrity. In a world torn apart by war and conflict, citizens of heaven, we bring peace. When it comes to a world of darkness and despair, citizens of heaven, we bring hope. In a world of, that is full of rejection, citizens of heaven, we bring love. In a world of sadness, citizens of heaven bring joy. We live a life down here that matters up there. As so we've got to be people who remember our true citizenship. Here's the second takeaway for us. Is we have to be people that, that truly fight for unity. And what do I say fight for unity? And, and the more I, I live, the more I rel- realize that, that nobody stumbles onto unity. Uh, unity doesn't just haphazardly happen. It requires not only intentionality, many times you have to fight for it. That, it it's got to be something that's, that's, that's moving enough that we really do whatever it takes to really try to accomplish. Uh, we live in a very, very divided world in, in today's terms. And, and gosh, we, we, we're making up ways to find ways to even divide and even further divide. And really left to its own devices, division just becomes greater. The gaps become wider. We figured out ways to divide around denomination. We, we've divided around race. We've divided around politics. You know, we, we've divided around masks. We've deri- divided around a disease. We figure out ways to divide ourselves to one another. But my friends, there's so much at stake with this. I would go as far to say our divided world needs a united church. Our divided world that we live in desperately needs a united church. This world will not unite itself on its own. This world will become more and more divided. But when it comes to the people of God, there is not another place on planet earth that people can be united despite their differences than in the church. Our broken, divided world needs a united church. Needs us to come together. And my friends, it won't happen haphazardly. We've got to be people who are willing to fight for it. We've got to fight for it because it matters. And sure, we may not think alike. Sure, we may have different opinions about politics. Maybe some of us are good with masks. Some of us wish that masks would go away. Maybe we have different opinions about whether kids should be in school or e-learning. We have differences all kinds of ways, right? But we as Willow Creek, our heart's desire is we want to continue to be a multi-ethnic and a multi-generation church. We believe there can be unity in diversity. And it's in unity, in diversity that we have an opportunity as followers of Jesus to bear his witness in our world. The truth is, when we look at the kingdom that we belong to, the kingdom of heaven, one day we're going to get there and we'll discover there's Republicans and Democrats there. One day we're going to get there and we're going to discover there were mask wearers and non-mask wearers there. Uh, We're going to get there. We're going to discover people of every tribe and tongue and nation. We're going to find people of every single ethnicity. We're going to find people of all kinds of different ages. We're going to find people who are rich and poor. The beauty of the kingdom of God is unity in diversity. And if that's true of the kingdom of God, that has to be true within the church today. My friends, we have to fight for it. Our divided world needs a unified church. And it's worth fighting for. And that doesn't mean we avoid hard conversations. That doesn't mean we avoid significant issues. It just means that when we address hard conversations, we love anyway. And it means when we disagree, even adamantly, it means that we offer grace anyway. It means when we step on each other's toes because we said something offensive, it means we freely forgive. The truth is, it, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort to bring unity. But I believe the beauty of the body of Christ exists when we can find unity in diversity. But my friends, there's a lot at stake here. Uh, Jesus, in his last, in some of his last days, he, he prayed for you and I. John chapter 17, look what he says about unity. He's praying to God, the Father, and he says, Jesus is saying, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples. 
You say, I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm praying for you and I. He says that we, that, that, may, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me and, and that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you and me. So that they may be brought to you in what? Complete unity. They catch this phrase. Then the world will know that you have sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Unity is not just a good idea. Attached to unity is our witness to the world of the greatness of our great God. And when the world looks at a diverse group that has found a way to come together, that's marked by love for one another, even in their differences, that's marked with grace, forgiveness, and is willing to come together, it's in the unity of diversity that we find such beauty and we can bear our witness of our great God in this world. My friends, we have to live a life down here that matters up there. Daniel's vision was clear. And the vision was we live in a world that kingdoms are gonna rise and fall, they're gonna come and go, and they'll continue to do so. But there is one kingdom and one kingdom that endures forever. It is God's kingdom. And my friends, your citizenship, my citizenship is connected there. Let's live a life worthy of the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And God, we say thanks for the book of Daniel, the vision that you, God, that you gave Daniel that opens our eyes to the reality that God, we live in a, in a broken, painful, difficult world that's sometimes full of division. God, we live in a world that the kings of this world, they try to thwart the things of God. They try to push down the things of God. But God, we're so grateful that you are a God that will not be defeated. That you are a God who's victorious. That you are a God who reigns supreme. And God, even in our darkest moments in this world, God, you still reign supreme. And so, Father, I just ask, as we live as dual citizens, not just connected to this world, but we place our citizenship with you in heaven, may we take the things of heaven, the unity of heaven, the beauty of heaven, and may we bring it into this world to see so that they could see your glory, your might, your power, your worth. God, unite us for your glory. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for that message, Sean. I love the reminder that we need to live lives down here that matter up there. Next week, Pastor Sean is going to be back with us to share a message on gratitude for Thanksgiving. So we hope to see you then. Have a great week.